All right, so we're going to be tackling Japanese history. Don't even think about it. I put the entire transcript in the comments. All your references are made already. By the time Ieyasu arrives on the scene, Japan hasn't really been one government in a long time. About a hundred years earlier, the shogun told his brother to be in charge, and then he had a kid and told the kid to be in charge, and things got messy. Japan has kind of a thing with putting kids in charge and then someone else puppeting them or taking power. It's kind of weird. Now, in a relatively small area split into a dozen mini-states, each with their own family hierarchies and backstories and friends and enemies and people they used to be best friends with in high school, but now they don't really talk that much except Facebook messages on their birthdays, so it's awkward. So there's enough characters and plot twists for a ten-season drama, but far too many for a five-minute YouTube video. Just know that in Fermikawa, where we lay our scene, two houses, both alike in dignity, were competing over who would get to keep the Matsudaira clan, which was evidently less in dignity. Mr. Matsudaira, father of Ieyasu, who was called something else at the time because he changed his name like a girl changes clothes, really wanted his family to serve the Imagawa clan, and was going to give them his son when the Oda clan snatches him up and tells Mr. Matsudaira that unless he betrays his friends, they'll kill the boy. To which Mr. Matsudaira says, Ha! I can make a new one. Go on, show the Imagawa how much I care about them. So now the Oda couldn't return him, but they couldn't really kill him either, so he just kind of sat there and grew up in captivity. The Imagawa later took him back and made him the new Master Chief of the Matsudaira, but when the tide turned and the Imagawa started getting hammered, he decided he'd take his wife and kid and jump ship to join his Oda buddies. Oda Nobunaga gives Ieyasu the task of holding down the fort in Mikawa while he runs off to conquer Kyoto, where the Shogun and quote-unquote Emperor are, I don't know, sipping tea and watching Rakugo or something. Now this may seem like house-sitting, and it was, but it presented Oda with the tremendous advantage of being able to march around the country wrecking fools without worrying about his neighbors preying on his backside. Even after he conquered Kyoto, backstabbing continued to be a thorn in his side, so he did what any reasonable gentleman would do and burned everything to the ground. Now this is when Ieyasu is rewarded for his dutiful service and Nobunaga passes him the torch, right? Not exactly. Nobunaga was a little unclear on the matter of heirs, and so even though he had a perfectly functioning adult son, the shogunate was given to a two-year-old, who was definitely the most deserving of the title and not at all an easy way for Nobunaga's right-hand man to take power for himself. Oh, yeah, Ieyasu was great and all, but it was Toyotomi Hideyoshi who was his real first mate. When Ieyasu vowed to take revenge upon his senpai's killers, Hideyoshi beat him to it, even though that required ending one siege, starting another, and building a fortress right next to the enemies practically overnight. But Ieyasu is like, dude, you know his other son isn't dead yet, right? And so the battle begins between the two greatest generals of the age, like watching a couple of super- Ah! It's just too easy! But while the fight was dramatic, the outcome was basically nil. Ieyasu gave up and only had to give up one son, so no big deal. And Hideyoshi had a good run. He took away everyone's weapons like a total buzzkill, but Japan was a little more put together. Except he tried to invade Korea, which did not go well at all. And then he died. Look, I can't go into details about everyone, okay? He died and left a five-year-old boy as his heir, and ooh, boy, isn't it a shame when someone takes advantage of your young heir to take power for themselves? Ieyasu at this point is pretty much squared up to be the next head honcho in Japan. A lot of people would take a guy who knows what he's doing over the son of a guy who got everyone killed in Korea. But of course he wasn't the only one who spotted the opportunity to take power. This guy, a great leader of bureaucrats, swoops in and rallies the armies. Bureaucrats, however, are seldom known for their military prowess, and he loses at Sekigahara and dies. At last, Ieyasu reigns victorious. He puts Japan together once and for all, mostly. And then he retires before he can do anything stupid and die with the young heir. Strangely enough, though, it's in his retirement that he does most of his most important governing. He finally gets the chance to settle down and start working on a nice little castle in a village in the east called Edo, which is still around today. It's a cute little country town called Tokyo. He also put his foot down on the Catholics who had been running around the country converting perfectly good Buddhist citizens into Christian sleeper agents. You know those Iberians. First they bring you Jesus and then they capture your people and take everything you own. This was around the time he turned Japan into a political time capsule in an effort to not get totally overrun like certain other East Asian empires, which worked really well for for a long time, but then, say it with me now, gunboats. And then he died. The end. You know how the Portuguese couldn't tell the Indians and the Native Americans apart? Well, apparently the Japanese couldn't tell the Indians and the Portuguese apart, because for a while they thought Christianity was some hip new Indian trend. If you want to see how Ieyasu's life work falls apart, then I refer you to Feature History's video on the Boshin Wars and the fall of the Tokugawa. Unless you just came from that video, in which case, don't tell anyone, but, uh, I've got a video on the Great Northern War. Ciao!